and send it to Ray straight away and send it to Russell. Uh, Ray, I had a call immediately. He knew my dad, Ray. The Fuck guy. off, no way. Yeah, he went to watch his fights. Wow. And then um, about 10 days into filming, he said to me, I was in the op- I was in the, the, the room with your dad when he got the brain scan. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Paul Mort Talks Shit. And today I am joined by, uh, in fact, I'm very buzzing that I've got this guy on because I'm sure he's going to be at fucking Brad Pitt's level uh, very soon. And I'm going to be going through his fucking agent and his publicist and his PR team. So, uh, Matt Hookings, welcome to Paul Moore Talks Shit. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Are you, me. Are you excited? Good. Yeah, it's good. I will, I, our shirt is slightly matching colour as well. I've noticed that. Mate, I have just realised I look like a Tango Ice Blast. <laughs> That's all right. I thought I'll wear a colourful shirt. He's going to wear something colourful. You can be the, you're the blue raspberry and the, when you get the mixed tango ice blast. Be nice. <laughs> I love it. So, so you guys listening in, you guys tuning in. Matt, I met Matt just a few weeks ago, actually, at the Tyson Fury, um, Fury Fest. And the first thing that stood out to me was, so Matt's just, I say just, made a movie that's just came out on Prime Video. It's fucking incredible. I'm going to recommend you all watch it. I'm sure we'll get into that. But the first thing that blew my head off when Matt said it to me was that this movie took 10 years to make. Like, mate, how did you, because this is, again, I want, it, I want everyone to get a bunch of value, and I think this is probably where we'll get the most value from you. How the fuck did you stay so patient for so long? Do you know what? I, 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 I actually don't know. It, it's, it's one of the sort of biggest testaments to, to being able to survive it. I think... I don't know, you know, there's, there's lots of things. First of all, I don't have children. I don't have crazy responsibilities. I don't have, you know, I don't even have a house. So all those things that kind of keep you, you know, in one area or in one place, I didn't have that. So that was, that was number one. I think number two, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's in my personality. I think I was so driven mm-hmm. by making this film that there was just no, the, the end goal of like quitting or not succeeding succeeding just wasn't in my in my mind or in my soul at all so there was kind of no plan b right yeah no plan b and the industry that i'm in the film industry is just you know it's incredibly tough so and you will get knocked down like absolutely like knocked down left right and center every single day and i think it's like it's a bit like boxing in a way you know, run straight into the boxing you know you either get hit in the face and you like it and you're like, come on, give me more. Or you go, no, thank you. I'm out. I'll, I'll get out of the ring. So every time that there was a knockdown or put back or a setback or Matt, you can't do this or give up, give up, give up. It just in, inside me it just went right. You know, fuck. I don't know if I can swear, but fuck you. I want it more and more. <laughs> and you can swear on my podcast more than anybody else's fucking podcast. Yeah, it was just like you know, fuck all of you, just, I, I, it makes me want to do it even more. So it just created more of a drive and more of a, um, you know, more of a will to do it. But, but there, there was, you know, that, that's not to say it was, it was easy. And there was, there was probably lots of times that I should have quit because everything I'm getting now is just people calling me from 10 years ago or eight years ago, or six years ago, just going, how the hell, you know, did you, how, how the hell have you done this? How, how have you kept sane and, and you know continue to do this and let alone delivered on a good you know on a film and all that kind of stuff so i to be honest i don't know it's been the most challenging experience of my life what's your what's your answer then when people are saying how have you kept it like what you must have some tools you must have some things that you do and that you say to yourself or what are some of the tools that you're using to stay um i think training helps um i think i think do you know what i think you've got to go through the bad side i think you've got to go through it i don't think there's like it's the cost answer. of admission. Yeah, there's not a good answer like, oh, I did this or I meditated or I did that. You know, the training was on and off. I bloomed in weight in certain projects. I did other things. You know, I was moving around different, different places as well. So there was no, I didn't really have stability to say, oh, I meditated every morning. It, I went through the hardship. Of it. And I think, you know, if you're going to do something that's going to hit a mark or, or you're going to do something for yourself in life or your personality, I think you have to go through the hardship. I think you have to go through the depression, the anxiety, the, the, you know, all these, all these difficult things. Obviously you've got to come out of it and you don't want to sort of damage yourself too much, but 
yeah, I, I went through it all and I just thought if this is going to get tough, then there's probably someone else out there that's doing something different, that's, that's equally going through something tough. Um, so I just, I just kind of, you know, I didn't welcome it, but I just sort of absorbed it and go, okay, if it's going to be tough, give it to me, give it to me, come on. And um, it fits, <laughs> kind of fits perfectly with what the movie is, right? It fits, it just fits perfectly, like that whole thing. So talk to me about this, mate, because I'm really intrigued by this. And I'm sure Brian would have asked you this question. <laughs> but Brian's a fucking whirlwind. So, what? so you guys are don't know. There's a guy called Brian Housemute who I've known since I was about 16, right? Yeah, when you best mate, Brian, I fucking love him. For a long time. Yeah. Brian's like a ring announcer and he's the compare for Tyson Fury shows and he's a fucking wild man. He's like me times 10. So Brian would have asked you this. Where did this whole idea for this movie Prize Fighter come from? Like where did that, what's the origin of that? Yeah, so this is where the story gets really interesting. So my, um, I, was on a, I was on a Russell Crowe film about 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Yeah. And I was filming a, a scene. We'd been on set for 19 hours. It was horrendous. Yeah. Smoke and everyone was knackered. And a guy in his 60s came up to me and said, you look the spitting image of a, of, a, of a boxer that I used to follow in the 1980s. And his name was David Pearson. He was British every champion and blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, that's my dad. Um, and look, we look, we look exactly the same. I don't know if I showed you a picture. No, you didn't. I'll, I'll whip one up now because it, it sounds crazy for a guy to say this, but so that's my, that's me at the top. <laughs> oh shit. In that's mad. Filming, and that's my dad at the bottom in 1983. Wow. That's insane. You know, we look, we look identical. So yeah. This guy recognized me. He basically thought I was my dad. My dad, my dad passed away from, from boxing related injuries. So he's not alive oh, anymore. So he's British heavyweight champion in the eighties. He passed away when I was 11 in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this, this guy said, look, his name was Austin, the, the chap. And he said, you know, you look the spitting image of him. And I was reading this article on your dad in the eighties. And next to this article was this bit about this beer knuckle boxer called Jen Belcher. So I immediately got drawn to, to, to Jen's story in this article that was next to my dad. And it just hooked me from the get-go. It was, it was the youngest, youngest ever champion. He was blind at 22 and he was dead by the time he was 30. And he had this Muhammad Ali-esque personality about him where he was way ahead of his time. He spoke differently. You know, he had the, the, the women after him. He's, he, he had this personality, this charisma. And he coined... The jab, he, he was basically one of the first to like, you know, really fast speed the jab. So I was just really hooked. And then I just went down this rabbit hole, uh, Paul, just, just madness. I mean, that, that's when the 10 year journey started. So it started off, someone recognized me through my dad and then just went crazy. I started, you know, I started research, I did two, two years of research. I was in the British Library, I was doing all this mad research, finding out all this stuff about him. And then look, all this weird, weird shit started happening so i find that his mum has the same name as my mum mary um the last fight he had with henry pierce henry pierce was from bristol which is the same last name as my dad pierce jem died on my birthday 30th of july yeah same weight same height same size so i just thought this is crazy um and you know people at the time were like you're like a reincarnation of him and I, i'm not it wasn't a massive sort of spiritual believer but yeah. It just, I just got led down this, this rabbit hole and then eventually just went, do you know what? I'm going to play this part and I'm going to get in the gym and I'm going to start boxing. And Had you, you know, never boxed before that? No, not really. It, you know, boxing was, you know, inherently like a part of my life through my dad. Yeah. But, you know, once my dad died, it was kind of like, that's the thing not to do. <laughs> um, you know, boxing, I, I, I sort of left and created my own life and went to university in England and, you know, moved out of Wales. So I fell in love with boxing through this experience and I, and I got to learn and know so much more about my dad through, through this film and experience. Um, so I fell in love with boxing. Everyone thought I was crazy. I was going out, I was training in uh, St. Joseph's, uh, which is like a, you know, one of the best gyms in, in, in Wales and in Newport with Lee Salby, Expo Champion trains and loads of, you know, really up and coming um, fires. Yeah, he was in. a fucking fighter, by the way. He was a fucking hell. I yeah, Gavin Gav Gav Wind like, trains there as well, yeah, Commonwealth yeah. champion, and, and they've got some really, you know, talented uh, boxers. So I started training there and just, um, 
and just got the bug for it, you know, started sparring and, and everyone thought I was crazy. I remember like four or five years ago, I was coming home with just like bruises and, you know, being in bed. And, you know, my mum and family were like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you battering yourself for a film? You don't know if it's going to get made. You don't know if you're going to be able to play the lead. What the hell are you doing? And you're training with professional fighters. But I just got the, you know, it, it was, it was, that was my, um, that was my escape. You know, you mentioned earlier, what, what did I do? I mean, that was like, right, if I had a stressful day dealing with dickheads online or, or yeah. dealing with people in suits who just didn't get it, yeah. I, I went to the gym and just, you know, exploded in the ring. So that that was like my escape. Um, fell in love with the sport and just started training, man, just started training. So I, I've been training, you know, as, as a boxer, essentially, for up until that point. And then it just yeah. went a bit crazy from there, so... Dude, what was the hardest part? Because you mentioned a couple of things there. And what's been the hardest part of making this happen? The doubt has, the knows. Dealing with, like, just people who don't care, who don't understand, but they want, you know, all the credit and, and they want to be involved, you know. It's not to say all lawyers, but, you know, the film industry is run by, like, lawyers, accountants, you know, basically, like, loan sharks, banks. It's not what people think, especially the independent side. Yeah. It's great if you get a studio on board that funds your film and says, go and make it. But this wasn't like that. This was, this was an independent film where I was, I was on call with 26 people, lawyers, accountants, financiers, and they're all like not doing their job yeah. or their work. And that's really frustrating because, and it's incredibly stressful because A, a lot of money is on the line. B, I can't control that. If it's me getting in the ring or acting or performing next to Ray Winston or Russell Crowe, I'm in control of that. So it's like, it's on me. But when you're dealing with people where there's paperwork or there's money that needs to land tomorrow, otherwise, you know, you can't film. And yet, you know, someone's just gone on holiday or they can't do it because they're in America or they don't really care. It's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating dealing with so many different people who, you know, they have an involvement, but they don't want to be involved, and, but they're responsible for, for signing this paperwork or getting this paperwork. So it's just a very, very, that, that process was incredibly frustrating. And, you know, you've got to try and sift through the sharks and people that, you know, will rip you off and try and um, take as much as you can from you. Um, that, that's, that was the biggest challenge um, and difficulty. Um, and it, I'm it, throwing it, a random question right now, Matt. Was it worth it? I think everyone would say yes. Yeah. I think, you know what? It was for some, I, I've learned so much. Like it's changed my whole um, way of, you know, doing business, of being, of, of acting. And, you know, I've had, some, I've had some wonderful experiences on it and built some really great contacts. It was worth it in that sense. Um, but in terms of the you know, the, the anxiety and the stress and, uh, you know, I've, I've had panic attacks. I've been to doctors. I've been, you know, my parts of my body are just fucked for life. My eye got slit during one of the fights, you know, all that kind of stuff. You just think, ah, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> we'll see. I think the answer to that is we'll see if, if someone checks me, you know, a million quid to do a commercial for a couple of days, then yeah, it's worth it. Um, or <laughs> if someone, one of those, one of those armpit spray ones. Yeah. Sure ones. I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, we'll see. I think it's so early. You know, the film's just come out like less than a week ago. It's number one um, in Amazon on the UK. So oh, sick, mate. When I watched it on Friday, it was on. It was number four. It's number one now. Yeah. So it's um, you know, it's it's opened really well. Let's see how the American audience responds to it. It's going out in cinemas elsewhere. I think um, I would say right now I'm, I'm 50 50. A lot of it was worth it in terms of the learning experience, just yes. life, life lessons yeah. and experience. There was a lot of pain. I would, I would not, you know. I generally think that I'm, I'm strong-minded, and anyone else, I wouldn't, I would not wish it upon anyone else because it yeah. was just a very, very horrible, challenging experience. Yeah. Um, and it definitely is enough to break people. So, I, I, you know, part of what I'm doing now, even, even this, is to try and encourage people to, you know, look after themselves more. I didn't look after myself. I was just eating, ballooning weight, doing this, doing that. You know, it was, it was just. I wasn't really looking after myself, staying up stupid, stupid hours, not, not sleeping. 
Um, and there needs to be more support. There needs to be more support from, from, from the studios and the independent sector, otherwise it's just going to die. It's not going to yeah. exist anymore because it, yeah. it's borderline impossible. And everyone, a lot of people that called me, the, the DOP from Mission Impossible called me the other day. He said, Matt, what you've done is, is, is literally impossible. <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so it, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a bit of a crazy ride in that sense. We'll what see. would you do differently if you, let, let's just say you were to do it again, right? <laughs> let's just say you were to do it again. You, you, you lost your mind. What would you do different? Definitely work with different people. Um, got stung along the way by yep. some, some people who were just in it just to, you know, take money or, or they could see very quickly that I, I was willing to work to the dying day. Yeah. You know, get Russell Crowe, get... It's, some people were just clever enough to go, well, Matt's going to do everything, so we don't have to do anything. Yeah. But we'll still take a paycheck and we'll still be involved. Yeah. We'll still pretend like we're doing mm -hmm. something. So definitely work with different people. Um, I think... I mean, we had, we had a lot of things against us as well. We were trying to make it during COVID. Things kept changing with Russell Crowe. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the support from Wales, which was just horrible, fell through. They didn't support me in Wales, which was just crazy. We didn't have no sort of creative support. So I think, um, I don't know. I think definitely work with different people. Yeah. More control. I know it sounds stupid, but I couldn't sort of, I couldn't walk around throwing like, my dick being like, hey, listen to me because I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I've been doing this for 10 to 12 years, so I do know what I'm doing. But when you, when, you, when you step into a bigger film like that, people always think, oh, well, because of your age or because of your, you haven't done this size film, then you don't know what you're doing. And I think that was the biggest mistake because, you know, I think if I was given a little bit more control and someone went, okay, Matt can do that under that pressure, yeah. under that budget, under those sort of restraints what can he do with a little bit of help and support so let's give that to him because i think i think i can probably shine more if yeah. um, if the support and the and the help is there um so yeah i think that's it i think the other thing as well is there were so many times i tried being getting on people's side and, and connecting with them like emotionally poor and it just it just doesn't seem to work especially in business and in the film business i was i was saying to people like look my dad has passed away and this is how I'm doing this story yeah. and I'm putting my life and soul into it I'm putting all my money into it I'm pulling in all, all my contacts I'm risking like so many things please help like yeah. begging begging for help I mean I was on the phone crying many times yeah. to like representatives in Wales and finances they just don't give a shit at yeah. all it was, was just any, like yeah. was there any time during that that you felt like was there, mo there gotta be times where you felt like saying fuck this Oh, yeah, yeah, loads of times. I mean, I was, I remember telling one of the representatives from Creative Wales. Um, so for three years, one of the, the, the creative sectors, and this is how kind of independent film works, you need to have a BFI or a creative government industry to support you. Otherwise, yeah. It's just so difficult. Yeah. Um, and I remember looking out of an of a office window, my dad's statue in Wales is, is just there. And I'm asking for like 250,000 while we're spending like a couple of million bringing Russell Crowe, Ray Winston, making a boxing film in Wales, in Newport that had never been done. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't get the support. And I just thought then, I said to the woman on the phone, I said, look, I'm looking at like, and this is crazy now because it's, kind of, it's kind of laughable to say. It. I was looking over at the bridge where like so many people just jump off and, you know, commit suicide in this place yeah. in Newport. Yeah. I was just looking over and I said to him, I'm looking over this bridge now and I've put all my money into this. I'm like, well, do I just go and jump off the bridge? Is that, is that what it takes mm -hmm. for you to just help and support? You've said, they said yes for three years, Paul. Mm -hmm. And then they pulled out in the last minute because they were, they were, they were funding Star Wars or something. So yeah. that was like a big, big blow. Um, so yeah, loads of times. I mean, but the thing is, what I learned was it, it, do, it doesn't really work. You've, got, you've kind of, well, it didn't work with these people anyway. <laughs> you've got to kind of be smart and just be like, clear clear head about everything because the moment they think you're unstable they yeah. they, they don't want to support you even more yes. um so i thought that would really work and i thought like getting on people's side and being like you know explaining my emotional connection to this story and why i'm doing this would yeah. work and it just yeah there's nothing in it for them then is there it's not even that they just it's like as if they just don't care i just i just don't you know sometimes they even don't know the full story they don't care or, you know, they work to a, to, a, to a very specific, like, 
set of rules. I mean, yeah. the one, you know, they, they were telling me it takes 12 weeks to turn around an application, which is like five, six pages. Fuck and no. I said to them, like, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm bringing crew, I'm hiring everyone in Wales. We're doing this on a daily basis. And you're telling me you with a team of people can't turn around an application. So it was just a bit crazy in that sense. And then, you Sounds know, like trying to get a fucking passport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is a bit. It is a bit. All you have to do I mean, is print it, mate. All you have to do is fucking print it. <laughs> I know. I know. It's crazy. And then some other places are completely different. I went back to Malta where we shot the Russell Crowe bit. We, we ended up shooting the Russell Crowe bit in the UK on Malta. Mm-hmm. And I go back to Malta and the guy shakes my hand and says, tell me what you need and we'll do it. And so it's, so those things definitely need to change, I think. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, so we mentioned Russell Crowe and Ray Winston there. Like, how, how the fuck did you get them on board? in an independent film. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy. So I, you know, I did a lot of stuff on my own, but I did have some help as well. I had, I, I, used, to, I used to do stunt work when I was sort of a little bit younger. Yeah. And I built a really good contact with a, with a stunt coordinator called Steve Dent, who's worked right. with everyone. He's done every project, he's amazing, he's done Marvel films. And he quite often is very close to some really key actors because they spend a lot of time with him at his farm. Yes. And rehearse and stuff. So he knew he knew Ray Winston really well. He knew Russell. He knows everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you know what? I did about 300 drafts of the script. I did so many drafts of the script, uh, Paul, and I just thought, I have to make this so good that whoever picks this up is just going to go, yes. We don't care who's on it. We don't care if Matt's playing the lead. We're in because the, the script was good. Yeah. And I, 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 I remember going to Steve's during the first lockdown and said, just read it. It's ready. Um, he helped. We helped. He helped me do a short film four years ago. So we did a short film in 2016. And what's that called, man? It's called The Birth of Boxing. Okay. Love it. Yeah, it's cool. And I thought all the money would drop after that. It was a really flashy short film. Yeah. Um, and I thought, yeah, we've nailed it. We've done. We had a Hollywood crew. Everything. I thought we did a screening at Warner Brothers. I thought. I thought the um, the money would drop straight away. That was it. Just, yeah. Just <laughs> didn't make it for another six years. Yeah. So. I said, Steve read it and he said, it's, it's very, very good. It's ready. I'm going to send it to Ray straight away. I'm going to send it to Russell. Uh, Ray, I had a call immediately. He knew my dad, Ray. The first Fuck off. Was. No way. Yeah, he went to watch his fights. Wow. And then um, about 10 days into filming, he said to me, I was in, the, op- I was in the, the, the room with your dad when he got the brain scan, which was like a big thing back then because it made the news and everything else. I was just kind of blown away. I mean, he told, you know, he told me more stuff about my dad than, than I ever knew, which was crazy. So he, um, he said, look, I knew your dad. I love the script. Came on board very quickly. And then Russell was like, I had to go through like his agents and managers first. And it was back and forth for yeah. a year. It was a bit of a, bit of a hard, um, you know, negotiation. They, they said no three times mm-hmm. before saying yes. So, um, but I never gave up. I remember doing this, you'll laugh at this. I remember doing this crazy run at night. I used to run at night and I used to play the Gladiator soundtrack. No one knows it. <laughs> but they do now. They do now. <laughs> this, is, this is first. Um, I used to run late at night in Wales, playing the Gladiator soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And every time Russell's team said no, I'd go out and I'd just run and run. And by the end of it, sprint, sprint, sprint to like, I'm just fully exhausted. And I don't know why, but I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to try and connect to him in that way, you know? Just kind of, right, do this, do this, come on, come on, come on. Mm-hmm. If anyone saw me, which they probably didn't because it was at night, they must have thought I was fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, and I think after three times of saying no, loads of reasons, you know, COVID and didn't want to travel and this and that. Yeah. After three times of saying no, Everyone was like, you've got to go somewhere else. Go, go, go and try Hugh Jackman. Go and try someone else. I said, no, he's perfect for the role. You know, he's, he, he, it needs to be him. Uh, he's got a boxing experience. His, his grandfather was Welsh. Um, so, yeah, I, we moved things around. And I said, look, we'll just do whatever it takes. And eventually he said, yes. Um, so that's how we got them. And then, you know, we have such an amazing, uh, the other cast as well, Martin Kosak's been in tons of stuff. Julian Glover, Bond villain in Game of Thrones, absolute legend, Stephen Burkhart, Jodie May. Um, you know, we've got Stanley Morgan, Glenn Fox, it's some really, you know, the cast was like a dream list that yeah. I've written down and just, just didn't give up until, yeah. until they yeah. said yes, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like for you working in particular with those two that everyone will know? Like, what was that? Wait, was there any starstruck shit happening or? 
No, I mean, look, I, you know, I did, I did so much stunt work before, and I, I, I'd worked, you know, very closely with, you know, Angelina Jolie and Tom Cruise, and, and oh shit, done some really like, you know, this, this was different because I was playing the lead role. Yeah. And that. was that always your was that always your plan playing Jem Belcher then or was yeah. it was yeah. that was it? Yeah, I mean, I, I I used to pretend I used to get in a room with people, producers or financiers, and they'd say, "Would you give up the role to make the film?" I'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah." No, fucking never. Yeah. Ne I was, it was never ever. I was never ever going to give up the role. As soon as I knew, once I started training, yeah, and I, I realized the connection between my father and and yeah. Jem with me. I just knew there was no one else right for it. And I remember, I remember in Lithuania, you've seen the end fight. The end fight is pretty, yeah, it's pretty intense. Pretty, yeah, intense. Pretty By the way, I mean, my, my wife said I had to tell you this. That part where fucking Ray Winsling cuts your fucking eyelid open. Yeah. She ran out, she, she ran out of the room. <laughs> she was like, you need to tell them that I fucking hated that bit. <laughs> You know what? It, there was like a there was like a few moments in it where we just had to make it brutal. And that end fight, I just wanted that to be one of the best, yes, realistic fights. And it was real. Look, the fight yeah. was real. We took real hits. The other boxer, who's an ex boxer, had um had his ribs cracked. Oh you know, shit! We, really? We knocked out. Yeah, we were getting knocked out. We just went for it, man. We went. For it. His dad, his dad, um, isn't alive either. So we had a really nice connection, and he's yeah. such a lovely guy, Ricky. Yeah. And we just went for it. And I remember walking on set that second day of that fight. And I just thought, you know what? There's no one else. It was the only moment where I thought there's no one else who can do this, you know, better or more so than me. I was trained for it. I knew the character inside. I had written the story. And, you know, I was willing to go in and have a... Have you were a willing punch. to get punched. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I'll have to, I can't wait for the behind the scenes to be released because you just see, you see me take like four or five shots, which are just like, like, crack! And then I was like, Rick, you've got to hit me harder. If you don't hit me harder, you've got to keep hitting me, and that's more pain. Yeah. And then it was like crack and then crack and just, it was over and over. And it was just yeah. so it was incredibly real. So that was like a that was a really nice moment. But you know what? It's it's a weird thing because so many times people could have replaced me. And I remember one of the financiers, it was like back in May, mm -hmm. and he just said, Look, um, if we wanted to replace you now, we can't. He said, because you have too much information. Yeah. You've hired your flipping mum, your dog and everyone to be, you know, the cleaners and whoever in the film and all your, all your contacts are through you. They yeah. all know how long you've been working on this. So they're not going to give, they're not going to do it unless you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think because of my, you know, because of, because I've made films as well, mm -hmm. I was able to kind of solve things quite quickly or efficiently that, that maybe, um, people didn't have or know and I had this, this huge amount of adrenaline so yeah. it was quite a funny moment where um you know he said if 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 someone else replaces you now it doesn't matter how famous they are we can't do it because you have all the information um and that that's how I, I if, if you know answering that question on how did you stick as the lead yeah. I know there's loads of stories you know about how Sylvester Stallone did it and he just said he's playing the part I just I just thought about it more sort of smartly I just thought you know what I'm going to put myself I'm going to put every single bit of information in this brain yeah. so they cannot replace me. Irreplaceable. Irreplaceable, yeah, in, in that sense. Um, it doesn't matter how famous people are, it doesn't matter what it is, just every bit of information, yeah. from script to character to, you know, locations to this to that. If, if anything goes wrong, you know, Matt can probably solve it. Not because, like, I was being sort of arrogant or egotistical, just because I made sure I had the information. And if I didn't have the information, I had a backup. So when there was like problems on set, I remember one problem on set, I, I went upstairs and like six people were around the monitor. They were like this, like, well, I don't know how we solve that. And I just went upstairs and went like, do this, do that. Let's move this here. If you move everyone around there, I'll go in the ring and I'll, I'll, I'll cheat it. And it was just like that. It was just like, right, okay. And then everyone's like, okay, let's do it. So it's, um, yeah, that's kind of how I made sure that I wasn't <laughs> replaced. <laughs> Matt, the, the one thing that I've been really interested in here as well is as it as Friday was approaching, what was that feeling like? Like as Friday was approaching, what were your thoughts leading up to that? Um I was I'm still a little bit kind of numb to it all because I haven't really there's still so much stuff going on in the background. They're still like doing paperwork and crap. Really? 
yeah, it's it's been a bit of a crazy ride in that sense. Yeah. Um, and you know, bloody a cinema chain approached me the week before release and said, the film's really good. It should be going out in every cinema across the country. And here's the offer. So I was, you know, there was like there was like other opportunities coming in straight away. Yeah. So it, it it was a bit numb. I mean, I was I was kind of excited for it just to kind of get out there. Yeah. In one sense. Um, at, at the same time, I wanted I wanted more time to do loads more. There was so much PR lined up. I could have yeah. you know, I could have done so many more dates with Tyson Fury. Yeah. We had interviews and things lined up that we could have done with key cast that we just didn't have time to. Yeah. And the way that Amazon work, they just don't really, they don't really kind of take any of that into consideration. They don't really care. They just think, right. Put so once they chose the date, you can't. Yeah. yeah. I would have loved it to go out in September. That would have given, given proper, you know, a big proper campaign to be built. Yeah. There's loads of boxing events and things I've been invited to. And, yeah. you know, all these different things that, that would have helped just really vamp up the hype of the film. But um, so I was I was kind of busy dealing with a bunch of stuff. And look, you know, it's I think the, res- the response since it's come out has been really great. I've just been yeah. inundated with messages and support and everything. It's yeah. been it's been incredible. Um, yeah, because my picture of it was fucking hell. I'm nervous about this launching. I'm worried about what people might say. But you're saying like you were so busy that there wasn't really any of that. Yeah, there wasn't. I mean, I was so busy that that I couldn't really digest or, or sort of, yeah. kind of sit down um i kind of you know i knew the bits there was bits that i knew that would definitely you know people, people would definitely love there's bits that i you know do and don't like yeah. and i think i sat down with a friend the other day and they said to me like what's the ending like and i said look the ending is really good and he said well that's what that's that's pretty much what most people end will, 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 will respond yeah. to if a film is really good throughout but the ending is bad people walk away and they're like oh so if the ending's good... But dude, uh, that's happened with things like Game of Thrones. Yeah. It's happened with, what's that TV show? Line of Duty on BBC. People are like, the ending's fucking shit. Yeah. So it changes everything. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think... I think um, I don't know. We'll see. It, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sort of big believer to see how things, how things develop. And I've, I've, I've had a couple of... Are you fucking out, mate? You can see that again. You fucking waited 10 years to get the thing out. I know, I know. So... <laughs> We'll see how um, we we'll see how things we we'll see how things respond. Maybe I'll maybe I'll be like super happy in a week or something. I'm okay. I'm fine. It's just um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just so much things to digest, and I'm still doing a million things. I'm, I'm still doing loads of stuff myself. So it's like yeah, it's really crazy. Even like you know, all the Tyson Fury stuff I've got. I, it what what I think one of the biggest things is you've got to try and get. It's really hard to get people to kind of be in your head and see what you see. Yes. Um, but if you can do that and get everyone on board, then you can kind of fly with it. I mean, so many people didn't know the story about me or my dad and I was sending them documents and stuff. So you just gotta like, people's attention span is so different these days. You've gotta try and, you know, yeah. find a way to get people to just pay attention basically. If they pay yeah. attention, then they'll probably enjoy it. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and then, and, and following up from that then, do you look into, like, were you worried about criticism? Do you look into the criticism? Do you read the reviews or? You know what? It's been um, I never. I used. I used to love bad reviews. It was really? Hilarious. Yeah, because I've done like I've done like you know I've done like five feature films in five years. So I've been really busy as well. And you know the first feature film I did, I played the lead, and it went out in America and it was quite popular. But um, the reviews were just funny, and I used to laugh. I think yeah. with this one, the I think there's there's a divide in this. Some of the highbrow reviews are just you know that you're, you're going to get the same thing with the guardian you know thinking oh you haven't got this or you haven't got that or yeah you know certain things are not historically accurate i don't really pay attention to stuff i think this this stuff means more to me because of the projects being closer and i think if people knew it's one of the only projects where most people when they watch a film they don't care about the history they don't care what's happened but i think this is one of those examples where if people knew what i'd just kind of gone through they would just kind of take a, a different view on it. I think. I think. Look yes. at it. Oh, okay. We didn't know that. And we, you know, maybe we, maybe that will change our opinion of it. And so I don't really, you know, there's been there's been mixed reviews. Some of the reviews have been bad and just stupid. You know, mm-hmm. just like you know, someone saying I, I look too clean or too this or too that. It's like, well, come on. Um, and some of, some of the reviews have been really good. So it, it seems like the audience have responded really well to it. I think anyone that has seen it who are quite sort of normal. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. They feel the heart in it. I think they feel the emotion. And, and you know, so many people have said they, 
they couldn't watch the end fight like like, like your wife they couldn't watch the end fight or they cried or this and that. yeah and i think sometimes you just got to pay attention to stuff and you just got to watch stuff and just just kind of get 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 involved and absorb and you know mate i think that i was just thinking that it's like just because someone like criticizes or doesn't like it doesn't mean they're right and your belief in that it's a good film seems to be stronger than their doubt that it isn't yeah and and honestly like in this industry i'm i'm so i've become so sort of yeah, smart and aware of what works and what doesn't yeah. that you know if someone writes a review and it's all bad but it's like stuff that doesn't make sense or matter yeah. yes you know it's just it's just bonkers i mean one one of the re- like i said one of the reviews was about me looking too clean and i should have been in a commercial not this film well <laughs> i mean okay. that's a mate that's a, that's a that's a praise it, yeah it, it, so, so exactly. i take that as like a praise or yeah. this or that so it's like yeah. and then someone will like you know someone will pick up on the historic side of it or they'll say oh there's no um there's no um you know transgender people in the film and, and we've got to be this and that and i just thought well we're making try, we're trying to make a historical film of the time that was that represented this yes. so you know some of the you just got to look at the reviews and think right what what bits are what bits me, are meaningful and what bits are not yeah. and you know I, I remember russell and, and ray telling me this you know they've gone through everything and they you know some films they're great yeah have bad reviews but the audience like it some films um are terrible but the critics like it. it's it's a very weird we've, we've had mixed reviews and there's, there's quite a few um you know there's been quite a few four and five star reviews that come out so i, I don't I'm know there's just... often there's often a big disconnect between the critics and the audience sometimes it's like massive so different what's why do, why do you think that is um i think i think critics are looking out for certain things they want to see mm. At, mm. or or hear and the audience are just looking for a feeling. Yeah. Um, I remember. I remember reading one critic, and they said, "Oh, it's it's full of it's full of corny lines, like um, Ray saying, uh, windows, uh, your eyes are the windows to your soul.'" Yeah. And it's like when you break that down, no, that's just one corny line. Yeah. The other lines are good. The other dialogue is really good, but you picked on but one people- corny line. People would say that as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, it, it's, I don't know. I think, I think, and do you know what? I, I think um, a lot of critics are, I hate to say it, but I think a lot of them are people who probably wanted to do what we're doing and they never did it. So, you know, they look for, they look for a reason to kind of pick out the faults. I mean, I suppose the fucking, the, the clues in the title, like a critic, the job is to criticize. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's what I mean. If 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 you criticize, then then great, that's fine. Um, yeah. That 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 is it. You'll pick out the bad bits. I used to say this all the time when people were reading the script. I said I used to say to people, "Don't tell me what's good about the script because I already know what's good. Tell oh, me really? what's bad. Tell really? me what's bad. See, that's a fucking great attitude. <laughs> yeah. That's tell me fucking... what. Tell me what doesn't read well. Tell me what doesn't play. You know, what doesn't sound great. Tell me. What, yeah. I don't want to know. And I used to get to a point where I'd be really, really sort of. Um, you know, aggressive to it. Like, I do not want to know what's good. Tell yeah. me what's bad. Because yeah. what's bad is the only things I can improve on. Um, yeah. And then you take the bad and you kind of then, you still have to, you don't do everything that people say because otherwise you're never going to be your own person or you have your own vision. You take what's bad and you and you you, you pick out the bits that, that, okay, yeah, that is true. I can make that, I can change that, I can make that better. Um, so, and obviously you have to, you're obviously paying attention to who you're taking the advice from as well, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember so many times where I was pitching this film and everyone, you know, so many sales agents and distributors turned it down um, so many times and said that, you know, it's just a male oriented boxing film that's, that's, that's not going to appeal to anyone else other than boxing fans. Yeah. And the biggest response we've had so far is female, females have enjoyed it. Really? Almost, almost more than males. Yeah, in a weird way. Because it has, it has a bit of heart to it, you know, and, and, and and period dramas are, are, are more um, appealing to females. And you've got your and you got your mum in the movie. Her yeah, story, and I think her I think story relate, is probably very relatable. Well, people, I think I think people relate to that the mother son relationship as well, yeah. Um, yeah. which is really what the story is about. So, um, so it's just a bonkers one, and, and even like 
you know, I've got, I've got so many emails I should send to sales agents and distributors yeah. to turn it down. I remember doing, I remember emailing one sales agent and they were telling me they couldn't do $2 million in pre-sales with Russell yeah. Crowe or Ray Winston. And um, I went out and did like five, $6 million on my own. I'm not a sales agent. I had no contacts. I just emailed the distributors directly. Um, and I remember, um, I remember another sales agent distributor saying, we really want to do it, but are you still playing the lead? And I just went, yeah. And they never replied. <laughs> so, <laughs> so many emails I want to send out to these people. But, um, you know. All with the end, with the first word saying fuck and the second word saying you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm not mad. I can't, do you know what? I almost can't wrap my head around getting that many no's and that many knockbacks and still going after it. Like, this is fucking top 1% of the fucking planet. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there was, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's weird. No one ever really said yes. That's the weird thing. So it's like, I forced it because of the cast and because, you know, we ended up shooting in three different locations which generate tax credits. So there was a big help on the tax credit side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's so weird because, you know, they just didn't, they didn't, even, you'd, you'd have like, I'd be running around can, you know, for five, six years and every meeting was no, 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 no. Or you'd have 10 minutes and you couldn't even get enough across. I remember chasing when Harvey Weinstein was, was you know, was, was, <laughs> was back making yeah. films before, um, before everything happened. Yeah. I remember chasing Harvey Weinstein around can, like handing him cards and him just like throwing it in the ocean. Yeah. Like next to me. He took a card and was like, yeah, whatever. Like threw really it, threw it in the uh, threw it in the uh, sea. So again, it's like it's like type of personality you, you have. You kind of you kind of every time there was a no, it was like, okay, how can I do it? How can I do it? Um, how can I do this better or how can I do approach it differently? differently? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just kept on, man. Just kept and, on. And, and speaking about like getting into these meetings and that, because we'll have a lot of people that get that, that maybe suffer with a bit of self doubt, a bit of nerves before important things. Like, what's your whole process there? Um, I mean, look, it's really hard to get into the meetings for a start. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to pay this product. There used to be a production finance market in in London, right? And I was broke as hell, man. I used to pay like three, 300 quid to go to this thing just to sit in front of these, these, these financiers, yeah. financiers yeah. who were supposed to give you the opportunity to make films. Mm -hmm. And I went a couple of years in a row. And I remember going the second year and I remember sitting in front of the financier and they were like, you've got more than what we have. You've got more access than us. You've mm -hmm. got, you know, we're just a tax credit lender. Or, or there, was, there was basically, there's a lot of bullshit on who like, finances what or who specifically does what yeah. it's not like what people think with someone you just sit in front of an investor and they go there's the money go and make it it's not that some most of the time they're putting money up against collateral which they're definitely going to get back so yeah. i'll give you five hundred thousand, but I'm, I'm guaranteed to get back six hundred thousand from the government yeah. yeah so it's like it's all this like kind of scheme and there's a big conveyor belt yeah. and i think if you're you know if you're lucky enough to get in the meeting i think you know, you have to kind of, I, I just, I did it so many times that I knew the information inside out. So I didn't yeah. need to prepare. I just could talk. Yeah. Um, I probably spoke too much because you only get 10 minutes and you, you kind of got to learn to just, you know, see what this particular person wants and respond to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so more asking questions then. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, my, my, my advice, which is a bit of a weird advice, would be probably not to, not to go into all the meetings. Just focus on like, grinding away at home where it's, mm. it's free and you can really make the best amount of work or project or emails or whatever. And then when the time is right, do a batch of like, you know, four to six meetings in a day. Yeah. Because when you do more, when you do a bunch of meetings in one day, you, you get comfortable and you get confidence of meeting. After you probably meeting. get a little bit better as the next one. Yeah. 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 And it's all in a day. You don't have time to go home and, you know, you don't have time to kind of, you know, reconfigure and do one yeah. this week and one next week. So um, I don't know, but it's, it's notoriously difficult to get to even get in the meetings. I mean, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Even if you're in the meetings, 90% of the time, the person, you know, can't, can't even help you unless you're like, unless someone says, right, you're going to pitch to the head of Netflix or the head of this or the head of that. 
Yeah, I think there's, there's so many middlemen, Paul, in the industry, but just it's just you know a lot of it is full of crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like the advocate for not going into film. <laughs> well, mate, let's let's rewind a little bit because I wanted to ask this, this at the start, but I've been obsessed with this ten year thing. So mm. it's like the first thing you said to me, and I was like, holy fucking shit, I need to know about this. Did you literally? Did you go from school straight into acting? I yeah, I went I went, I went from school into um, I studied I studied film and drama at university, mm-hmm. and I did a little um, stint of, of, of business studies as well. Yeah, and I mean I didn't really I loved university it was a great great experience for yeah. life and a lot of fun, but yeah. I didn't really walk away with tools of like things I could use. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't really geared to the film industry. Yeah. So I moved, I, 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 moved, I went straight back to Wales to be an extra on Wrath of Titans for six weeks in Wales. Really? Yeah. And- Wrath of the Titans, wow. Yeah. It, it was that is a big, talk about big budgets, that's a big budget film, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was crazy, you know, just coming from university, stepping onto like a, whatever, like $150 million set. Um, and it was like a bit of a training army camp. So it gave me it gave me a nice bit of discipline. Yeah. It gave me everything that I needed to see and and and, and have from the film industry. Being a being a being a, a being a background artist or even the stunt side is wonderful because ninety percent of the time you're doing nothing. So you yeah. can, if you're interested, you can watch. Yes, you can speak. Yeah. To that guy's doing sound lighting. What's he doing? What's she doing? But and connects so, and connects as well, right? Yeah, and you pick the right moment. So I was very good at. I, I just basically it was like a couple of hundred of us. I got into like a core team of ten yeah. where we were doing more specialized stuff and falls and bow. You know, I was taught by one of the best bow and arrow um, archers in the world who taught Russell Crowe and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I just learned all this information. I just absorbed everything. And also, I became. You know, with my acting background, I was able to do stuff. You know, I was able to react to stuff and falls and stunts. Yeah. And from that, in Wales, I moved to London, mm-hmm. and then just started doing this. At the time, it was called like special action stunt work, which was, um, you know, bits of inf- bits of time on 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 these Hollywood uh, films. I did Maleficent, I did Snow White and the Huntsman, I did Edge of Tomorrow. I did lo- I did loads of stuff. I did about like 30, 35 productions in the space of like a year. It, it just oh, worked shit, really. Stuff. Yeah, and, and, and I'd, I'd be called in for like five or 10 days and then end yeah. up doing a lot longer. Yeah. So Maleficent, for example, I did like 55 days on it and I got to work closely with Angelina Jolie. Yeah. And that was just great. But I just absorbed everything. And over the years, I was taking little contacts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This. I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer in this concept. Like last year, probably my biggest personal lesson was I think we're always like, how do I do this and how do I get that? And my whole thing is, there's a book called Who Not How? And I'm like, who can introduce me to him? That's how I know Tyson, because yeah. I know Wardy, yeah. right? And who introduced me to Wardy was Bry Houseby. Yeah. And then I've done that in throughout my career. So who knows that? Who can open that door for me? Who's got that contact? Who's already doing that? Who could introduce me to him? So I suppose that's kind of being one of your secrets. It's, it's, it's the best thing. I think people, you know, I honestly think people should kind of, you know, put down the books and just go out and meet people relationships relationships it's all about who you know yeah. and it took me like a good couple of years and i thought right either i've got to go into a very specific field in the stunt world now and really take this seriously and the money was great and the experience was great yeah or do i do what i really want to do which is act and create my own stuff and i started to see the mistakes paul i started to work on like these hundred or two hundred million dollar films and then the films end up being rubbish or this person doesn't know what he's doing or the director didn't know what he's doing. So I was just like, oh my God. Yeah. So I just made a bit of a drastic. And I bet that's quite a hard decision to make because with that stunt stuff, it, it's almost guaranteed work, guaranteed money, good money. Yeah. 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 It, it was, it was, and that's another bit of like. Safe. Was, safe probably, even though it's yeah. stunts, is probably safe, the safe option. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's the, it's the biggest, I think it's one of the biggest things that people don't do and that is take an extreme risk that that alters their safe um way of living yeah for me it was going from you know working with really cool people getting paid really well yeah. jumping from job to job traveling this and that, yeah. and that and i just gave it all up and just stopped it all and said yeah. no 
And I wanted to do that because I just, I felt like I built the tools and the, um, I, I felt like I'd learned enough to go, wait there, maybe I can start creating my own stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, maybe I should start writing and create my own stuff. So I set up my own production company and started making short films. And I went from one short film, which was, you know, had all this action and stuff in it. And then I went to the end, which was like 12, film, 12 short films later, yeah. where it was just Julian Glover, who's also in the film, who plays the Lord, yeah. sitting in front of a TV talking about 9-11. And it was just, you know, it won tons of awards and it just did really well. And I just... And was, there a, was there a transition point then or was it just fuck it, I'm balls deep on this? Um, like it was it like okay well while I'm doing this I'm going to do a bit of this on the side or was it just like fuck this I'm out I mean I, I was working like I was getting up at like 5 o'clock in the morning working working the stunts till like 9pm sometimes sleeping in my car because I just was so tired to just yeah. go home yeah at the studios and then on weekends I would make short films so oh, it, yeah. it was a, there was a little bit of a transition period but mm. there was a transition period throughout the stunt stuff and then when I said right I'm doing it it was hard Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this yeah. so I I then just went into making my own films and started writing my own stuff and, and you know becoming becoming a better writer and, and a better producer and, and building contacts and like I said um, I went from the end short film which was really great with Julian Glover yeah. to then making feature films and then you know just learn something new and, and worked with different people along the way um, and in the background I say in the background, every <laughs> alongside all this prize fire was training or more scripts or brewing or this and that. I mean, I've, I, I spent like so much money just on printing decks and traveling to meet people. And, you know, an investor wants to meet at like 10 o'clock at night in a hotel. Okay, I'll go meet him. You know, just all these different things, just constant like. So this has been your life for the film has been your life pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Like, all of it, 100% yeah. of it. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's. And uh, I suppose that's what it takes, though, right? I think so. Yeah, I think. I mean, the, I don't know whether I've gone through this experience to learn so much from it, which means yeah. that the life lessons are going to be bigger than you know the actual experience. Yeah, I think you know it's it's highly unusual what I've done. I, I, I you know, my stepdad was calling me last night and he said, "Look, you don't realize you're like." Yep. You're like one in like 20 million or 100 million. So there's like, this, this, this just, this, this doesn't happen. The last time this happened was on Rocky, which was like nearly 50 years ago or more. And he didn't have Russell Crowe and he didn't have, you know, Ray Winston. He was just yep. him on a, on, you know, and, and, and the industry was very different then because the, the, the finance was all there. Paul, this fell through like so many times. Yeah. I was waking up with anxiety and going to film. And then at the end of filming, 10, 11 o'clock, and I'd been told the film's getting shut down at the end of the week. It was, just, you know, all, and it was like that through the whole thing. Yeah. So, you know, there was lots of times I was on set and just walking off and bursting into tears because I just couldn't, I just had to go, whoosh, let it out, come back in, do a job. Yeah. And then, you know, someone's, someone comes to me and say, Matt, you signed this loan document to get some more money. It's like, you know, it was just, it was just mental. So I think, I don't know, it, it's, it's, I think it's worth it in the sense for, for the life lessons and stuff, yeah. you know, it, it's incredibly difficult. Every challenge that you could ever go through, I think I went through. The life <laughs> lessons are fucking phenomenal here. What's next, Matt? Um, next? Apart from have some time off, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I should take a break, but I, I don't know. It's 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 not really in my <laughs> nature. Um, I so I've I've also I've, I've got a um, I've got a mafia book that I optioned that I'd love to do. It's a, it, the problem is it's bigger than prize fire and it requires, you know, more, <laughs> more prize fire, you know, more than what prize fire did. It, it's a true story mafia film set in the 1950s. Yeah. About a Chicago police officer who's also linked to the murder of JFK. And, and it, you know, it's really, really textured about this time. And he had this yeah. horrible death. So I'd love to do that. Um, but, you know, the, the, there's the possibility of a TV series brewing. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a spin-off of Jack Slack that could easily be done. There was so much, the boxing at this time was so really like exciting. There was all these different people doing different stuff. There was female boxers. There was boxers before and slightly later. So there's a lot of stuff. You know what I loved about the film? One of my favorite things were you guys, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but at each stage, you guys, I don't know if you did it on purpose, but there was, there seemed to be where you were like, and you get 30 seconds rest if you fall down. 
if you get knocked down. And then there was 10 seconds and then there was rounds and then the, like, was that on purpose? Yeah. So the, the story, the story the rule is, sets evolved, right? Yeah. From the rules and, to... and, and this is like, this is like, you know, some of the criticism was like, oh, it's not historically correct. It's like, well, I'm trying to tell a story that shows the birth of boxing and the evolution. Yes. So the birth of it is in a field with bare knuckle, Russell Crowe, you know, that's really, the end of it is gloves in a ring, which has proper rules and regulations and has a proper count and everything. And, you know, it's, I think the, um, the most important aspect about that was the telling that story. And yes, the gloves in that end fight were, they weren't actually used in that end fight, but yeah. we had to use them, first of all, to, have, to make the fight as real as possible, yeah. to show the progression of the sport. And also, what people don't realize is I did, I did two and a half years of research and there was boxers at the time using gloves. They were sparring in gloves. Some people had fights just because it didn't come out for yeah. another 10 or 20 years. doesn't mean that people wasn't using it. Yeah. They were using gloves. So it's like it, it, the, the whole idea of the story was to show that transition of, of yeah. the birth and sport. I thought, that, I thought that was amazing. I, pick, I picked up on that quickly. I was like, that's amazing. How the, every time they got in the ring, there seemed to be something... Something and different, yeah. Different. Something new. And, you, and it was pointed out as well. It wasn't like, well, I was guessing that they were using yeah. I was guessing that. I think that, that, kept, that keep, I think that keeps the fights exciting as well. And yes. um, it keeps the evolution of the sport being told. So there's loads of stuff that could, that could develop. And, there's, you know, there's, there's a big potential for, like, a Peaky Blinders-esque TV series that come off the back of it. Oh, so, so, you know, I'd have to have some serious support <laughs> to do Sick. it. I wouldn't do it again on my own. But, Sick. Um, so, Matt Huggins, uh one, thank you so much, mate. This has been fucking fascinating and inspiring, mate. Two, um, I'm going to let you guys, I'm going to let you tell everybody why they should watch the movie and where to watch it. So you can watch the film on Amazon for free. Um, should be on the front page or the landing page. It on is. The, on, the, on the first uh, movie section because it's, uh, it's, it's popular at the moment, which is good. So let's keep that going. Um, I think you should watch the film. Look, if you're a boxing fan, it's a no-brainer. It, it's, 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 it's a film set at the beginning of the sport it's never been done before there's never been a boxing film set this far back and there's never been one that explores the birth of the sport i know because i've seen 160 boxing films <laughs> is that a true number is that a true number yeah holy 100, shit 160 boxing films from 1927 till now so um wow i, I watched everything yeah insane shit, mate shit um, yeah, if you're a boxing fan it's a no-brainer uh, yeah and i think you know, it's got a really heartfelt story to it as well yeah. you know a really nice strong mother and son relationship it's a period drama it looks beautiful it's textured it's it's at a time that i think is interesting for lots of people especially everything that's going on in yeah. the world now you know there's, there was lots of things changed at the time as well so it's really interesting there was a war going on and there's all these social and economical changes so yeah. i think it has it has that appeal and, and look the main thing i think is it has a lot of heart. If you just sit down and watch this film and try and, you know, just put your phone away and just focus. I, I find it difficult. Um, but, you know, if you can focus for an hour and a half, I think you'll feel something. I think there's a lot of heart in it. And I think you'll walk away going, do you know what? I felt that emotion and that drive and that passion. It does have a bit of everything, you know. Yeah. It does so think, have a bit of everything. I think it just has that. I think it just has that heart. And, you know, there's a bit of light comedy and humor from Ray and, and you know there's so many flipping Russell Crowe fans out there so we're um we spend most of our days replying to Russell Crowe people so I think um you know it's got some it's got some good cast in it amazing um, yeah amazing Matt Hookins uh, thank you so much mate it's been incredible you're a star thanks Paul thank you. all right let's